Welcome to SIG Auto Scaling. Um, this talk is going to be uh, both a quick introduction to Kubernetes auto scaling and a little bit of a deep dive. We're going to cover some best practices um, for running Kubernetes auto scaling in production. Uh, my name is Joseph Burnett. I'm here with Guy Templeton, who is the co lead of SIG Auto Scaling. Um, so he'll take over in the second half and uh, run you through some, uh, some practical tips. So this is the agenda. I'm also going to touch on, talk on a couple um, upcoming features so um, you can get a preview for what's coming in the future. We'll save about 10 minutes for questions at the end. OK. So Kubernetes auto scaling, like the rest of Kubernetes, is sort of divided into two levels, the workload, which is the pods, and the infrastructure, which are the nodes. And uh, the workloads can scale out or in. You can make more or fewer of the same kind of pod. And they can also scale up and down, which is making the resource requests larger or smaller. And the corresponding autoscalers are the HPA and the VPA, the horizontal pod autoscaler and the vertical pod autoscaler. So the same concepts of vertical and horizontal apply to cluster autoscaling as well. Um, cluster autoscaler scales a node pool uh, in and out by making more and fewer nodes. And it's also capable of scaling vertically by selecting different node pools. So if you have node pools of different sizes in your cluster, it can make intelligent decisions about which one to use. Um, but to kind of make it real con concrete for you, I'm going to walk through a practical example. So here we have a happy little cluster. You have two workloads deployed here. There's the blue pods and there's the purple pod, and they're deployed on three nodes. Now, both of these workloads are auto-scaled. Let's say that the um, blue and purple workloads are auto-scaled horizontally on CPU utilization and vertically on memory. And the cluster is auto-scaled as well. So when there are new nodes, new nodes will be created when new nodes are needed. Um, so suppose that blue service gets some more traffic and the HPA will notice that the average utilization is slightly higher than the target. It will figure out how many pods it needs to create in order to bring that back down to the target value. Um, and it will cause those to be created. Now, the HPA doesn't actually make the pods here. What it does is it is it looks it, it looks at the scale target ref. So it, it takes a scale sub resource. It looks at the pods that are selected by the label, gets the current scale, and when it has a recommendation, when it thinks you need more, it just updates that scale. And if this is, for example, pointed at a deployment, that deployment will turn around and adjust the size of the replica set, and the replica set will create the pods. And then the scheduler will see these pods, and it will schedule them onto a node, and the node will see the pods, and the pods will be started. So the auto scaler is actually sort of a, just a controller around this one scale sub-resource knob. But ultimately, um, the cluster creates two more nodes, or two more pods, because the auto scaler thinks that we need more. So here they are. And they get scheduled onto this node because there's there's room for it. So then uh, maybe a little more traffic comes in for the purple service. Well, same thing. The, uh, the HPA will notice that we're a little above target. It'll decide we need two replicas instead of one. And it will adjust the deployment. And a pod will get created. But as you can see, there's not a node for this pod. Um, the scheduler is unable to place it anywhere. And this is when cluster autoscaler kicks in. So cluster autoscaler responds to unscheduled pods, not like the underlying resource metrics. So cluster autoscaler will say, oh, I clearly need to scale up the cluster. And what it does is it runs a simulation. And it says, if I was able to, if I create another node, will this pod be able to be scheduled? And if the answer is yes, then that's the thing to do. And it can do this across multiple node pools. And it can do it you know, in more than one node at a time.
so it actually has a little simulation of the scheduler because it's ultimately up to the scheduler where these pods go. So the cluster autoscaler says, yes, we need another node. This sounds good. It creates the new node. The scheduler puts the pod on that node. And then the purple service has scaled out. So over time, uh, VPA, which is paying attention to the actual resource usage as compared to the request, may notice that the purple service is asking for way more memory than it needs. So it's going to draw a little histogram and figure out like a conservative place to draw the line, and it's going to recommend a smaller pod size. So the recommender makes this change, and then um, there's a, an updated process that comes through and will carefully delete the pods one by one and cause them to be recreated. So the updater is going to delete this pod and a new, new pod will be recreated because the replica site will always try to replace the pods and it will be recreated with a new smaller size. Um, so this is, uh, this is how VPA actually causes pods to change their size. And you may notice that it's actually a little bit disruptive because you actually have to delete pods. Um, a really important part about using auto scaling effectively is being able to control and man manage that disruption. And so Guy is going to tell you uh, in a little bit how you can do that, point to some tools and best practices for managing disruption. Um, then VPA updater is going to delete the next pod and it will get recreated as well. And you'll notice that actually there's an empty node here now. and Cluster Autoscaler will notice this too. It's able to delete that node and scale the cluster in. So you can see that the Cluster Autoscaler goes out and in. Um, usually these nodes are what you pay money for. So it's good that it can scale down um, because that's what's actually going to cost. That's what's going to save you money. Um, now, suppose that maybe at the end of the day, the blue service loses some of its traffic and uh, just, just HPA decides to naturally scale down because utilization is really low, some more pods will be deleted. And they're not going to get rescheduled because they just don't need them anymore. So you may be in a situation where um, you could actually fit more on the nodes that you have. And Cluster Autoscaler will notice this. And it will go and it will delete a pod so that it can be rescheduled onto the existing nodes. In effect, it will do some defragmentation for you. So again, it can free up nodes uh, and scale your cluster in. So this is kind of a quick view of the, the way that vertical and horizontal auto scaling go in and out. The cluster goes out and back in again. Um, and yeah, that's, that's the summary of the problem space. So this is the end state of your cluster. And uh, I wanted to mention a couple upcoming features. So I talked a little bit about CPU utilization or memory utilization. And it, when you use HPA or VPA, you point at a target. Um, you point at one of these resource metrics and you say, I'd like you to shoot for this. Now, there can be more than one container inside of the pod. And uh, an upcoming feature for HPA uh, allows you to set individual targets for each container. For example, if you have a sidecar that it is likes to use a lot of CPU, you don't necessarily need to scale on that sidecar, and it may overwhelm your calculations. Or if you have a sidecar that has a very generous resource request and is mostly idle, um, it may water down your, your metrics. And so um, take a look at this cap here. The, it's already gone through API review, and it's just going to land very soon. Um, and it's a nice way to focus the HP on, on specifically which containers um, are most important to you in your auto scaling. And the second uh, thing that we're working on in the SIG auto scaling group is graduating the V2 beta 2 API to stable. It's been around for quite a few years uh, and it definitely needs to get graduated. The um, all of the uh, ability to scale on multiple metrics and custom metrics um, are a part of the V2 API. So they've been around for a while. So we're going to work on making sure, taking all the boxes and making sure we can get it to a stable state. 
Um, so that's a little bit about uh, auto scaling. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Guy now, who will walk you through some practical tips about running Kubernetes auto scaling in production. Guy. Okay. Thanks. Um, so just for a bit of context here, I'm a senior software engineer at Skyscanner. Um, so a lot of what we do is running workloads that are involved in scrape, either getting prices from um, online travel agents or airlines, um, and then doing field training uh, and that sort of thing. This will this will come into uh, play in a couple of the examples I give for things that we should consider. Um, so I think as a lot of people uh, watching will know, um, a lot of the hardest problems in computing aren't technical problems, they're people problems. And this is one of the spaces where the complexity of all the options and all the, the tunable parameters and knobs that uh, Kubernetes gives developers and cluster admins um, can overwhelm developers, especially when they're first getting started. And I think uh, a lot of the time developers can not know exactly what, what options they need to consider when looking to scale workloads safely and perform uh, in a performant way. So I'm going to go over um, a few of these options that I think developers should at least be aware of. Um, and potentially, if you're cluster admins, um, providing your developers same defaults to work from um, and potentially override if uh, your developers uh, need to or want to. Um, so the first one is uh, lifecycle hooks. So uh, in our in Skyscanner's case, um, we occasionally have some very long running requests, whether that's to fetch prices or uh, reach out to partners who we'll uh, make bookings with. Um, and in that case, we don't want to drop an in-flight connection, especially if it's making a booking. Um, so instead, what we want to do is set up our pods such that when they're terminated by scaling action, wherever possible, um, they gracefully terminate and finish the work that they're currently doing before shutting down. Um, so this is where um, pre-stop lifecycle hooks can come in. So if, if you define a pre-stop lifecycle hook, which can either be an HTTP request or an exec, so a command into the pod to call a binary, for instance, um, the the uh, kubelet, when terminating that pod, will uh, execute that lifecycle hook at the same time as sending in a sig term. So you can either set up your application to handle the sig term gracefully, or instead you can make use of, say, an API endpoint that can be hit by the the lifecycle hook, use that to gracefully finish any work and refuse new work potentially, and then uh, allow the kubelet to shut it down. Um, so these pre-stop hooks, they're blocking um, and will block up to a grace period. So if you need to, uh, more than the default 30 seconds to gracefully terminate, you'll need to set this up in your pod spec, but by default, it'll give you 30 seconds for that command to complete. Um, you can also make uh, use of what are called post start hooks. Um, and again, these can be HTTP or uh, execs into the pod. Uh, they're not guaranteed to run before the uh, container's entry point, but if you need to do some sort of uh, environment dependent setup work, you can make use of those. Um, the next thing is liveness and readiness probes. So these are, these are fairly key if your workloads, for instance, on startup need to do some sort of uh, runtime compilation or something similar to um, ensure that you're giving your users the best possible experience. Um, so in this case, you can use liveness probes to mark your pod as alive and healthy so that the kubelet won't uh, re restart the pod. However, you can use readiness probes to state that the pod is currently not ready to receive um, traffic. Um, and that can be particularly useful uh, in combination with the HPA. So the HPA, um, when a pod is not marked ready, so if it's doing some CPU intensive uh, work to begin with, the HPA will not um, consider those that pod's metrics until it is marked ready. So that, that ensures that the HPA is not seeing new pods come up, use a lot of CPU, and then over going, oh, I need to overscale again. Um, the next thing is pod annotation. So in the case that you might have, say, a machine learning workload where if you interrupt that pod um, via scaling or the cluster autoscaler is trying to bin pack, uh, you might end up with the workload interrupted and effectively losing work or data. Um, in this case, you can mark pods with this uh, cluster autoscaler 
uh, safe to evict annotation. And if you mark that as safe to evict equals false, effectively when the cluster autoscaler is considering bin packing, it will notice that that node has a pod on it, which is not safe to evict and therefore not consider it as a candidate for scale down. Um, so theoretically, you can spin up workloads which are marked as safe to evict equals false, um, and then either update that annotation or remove it to safe to evict equals true at the point where they're, they are then safe to evict again, um, to ensure that your workloads are not interrupted by the cluster autoscaler. It's important to note that this doesn't prevent any interruption, so hardware failure, etc., or manual deletion of nodes will still impact that pod, but the cluster autoscaler won't interrupt it. Um, and vice versa, you can also use that uh, annotation as set to true to override some uh, other behaviors, which generally the cluster autoscaler will mark. Uh, pods as not safe to evict. Um, so things like if it's if a pod's using local storage, the cluster autoscaler by default will consider that pod as being unsafe to evict because it doesn't know what data it's writing to the local disk. It doesn't want to cause data loss. Therefore, it's uh, it will not try and move that pod around. However, if you can tolerate the loss of that data, then you can mark it if, um, yourself as safe to evict and the cluster autoscaler would take that into consideration. Um, so pod disruption budgets are probably one of the most important things. So um, going back to Joseph's example of the VPA, uh, where it was recreating pods um, due to changing the uh, resources given to them, the cluster scaler and VPA both respect the pod disruption budget. So this, this is a really uh, granular way of uh, service owners being able to define how much disruption their, their workload can tolerate. So if a given service can tolerate, say, 20% of its pods at any one time being moved around and being unavailable um, without harming the user experience, the the pod disruption budget is the way of defining that. And then the uh, cluster autoscaler and vertical pod autoscaler will take that disruption into account and therefore never uh, perform a disruptive action which would cause that budget to be exceeded. Um, it's important to note that this is this is the way to define this so that um, other components uh, respect how uh, services want to be moved around. Deployment rollout strategies, which are uh, a sort of more coarse uh, setting that people may be more familiar with, those aren't respected by these tools because they're that's not what they're set up to um, look at. Um, and finally, for this slide, uh, pod priorities. So this this allows you to decide which workloads are um, or should be prioritised when your cluster currently doesn't have enough capacity for all the pods. So if we think back to Joseph's example again, where one of the services was scaled up and there was not enough room in the cluster for all of those pods, um, if instead one of those workloads was the pod, the workload that had been scaled up was of higher priority than the uh, than some of the existing pods. Uh, some of those existing pods, if they could have been evicted and higher priority pods been scheduled, those would have been evicted. So you can effectively say, if if there's not currently enough room on the cluster, I want to prioritize this user impacting workload um, and I'm okay with this um, background task workload, which I've marked as lower priority being evicted for a period of time. The cluster autoscaler would still then um, kick in once those lower priority pods were unschedulable and scale up the cluster so that they could be scheduled again. But it allows you to get the um, high priority workload scheduled faster. So horizontal pod autoscaling. Um, so there's a, a few things here, especially around um, making sure that you, you optimize your scaling with respect to cost. So in, potentially you could have a service owner um, misconfigure their horizontal pod autoscaling rules, maybe a, a metric that's, that's never quite uh, reached a target utilization. Um, which can lead to runaway scaling. One, one way of handling this is namespace level resource quotas. So this allows you to effectively um, say in a number of dimensions, so pod, CPU, and memory, what is the maximum 
resources this namespace can ever make use of. So never let this, never let pods in this namespace uh, take up more than 100 CPU cores, say. And that that will, um, the horizontal pod auto scale will still work. It will try and increase the desired uh, capacity of whatever its target is, but the uh, resource quota will then prevent new pods, which would cause that resource quota to be exceeded um, from being created. So it's really important for preventing any runaway scaling and potentially costing you hundreds or even thousands of uh, dollars. Uh, we then have uh, so metric sources for non-resource metric based auto scaling. So this has been covered in great detail by uh, previous SIG auto scaling KubeCon talks, but uh, you can scale as well as on resource metrics on custom or external metrics. So the, in this case, a lot of cases, um, uh, there will be a better metric than say CPU or memory utilization for scaling on. So you that could be number of HCP requests in flight or something similar. And that's that's uh, a way of optimizing the scaling far far more than CPU, for instance. Um, we've also got pod affinities. So if you want to spread your pods out or schedule a workload uh, together um, for uh, best performance, then potentially you need to uh, set up pod affinities. So you can either make these to nodes or pod based um, so that you can try and spread spread um, pods out to minim uh, maximize uh, fault tolerance. Um, there are the pod affinities, however, are quite coarse um, and there's a new concept coming in um, that is slightly better for these. Um, as Joseph already mentioned, beware of the current behavior on uh, resource metrics. It's the fact that they're across the entire pod um, is particularly uh, an issue if, for instance, you're injecting sidecars, like you've got a service mesh or you're injecting logging containers or something like that. Um, it's particularly if you've got small containers and you're running, say, um, Istio, you're injecting an Istio envoy sidecar. If that's doing a lot of work, you can end up causing unintended scale up, particularly if your developers aren't aware of these. Um, and finally, the the more fine grained version of um, pod affinities topology spread constraints. Um, so this is only in beta as of 118. So um, I'm guessing a lot of people won't have had a chance to play around with it. However, uh, it's implemented as a scheduling plugin, so it allows you to define either hard or soft scheduling constraints to scheduling pods over different failure zones, whether that's a host or a rack or an availability zone in the cloud. Um, and it provides more flexibility than pod affinities and anti-affinities, and it allows you to try and balance your um, pods as best you can over as many um, fault zones as you can. Um, so for an example of this, um, you can see this graph. Um, here, every color um, represents a different instance type. Um, and this is one service in Skyscanner. And it, you can see, despite the fact that Skyscanner currently support uh, over 20 instance types in our clusters, uh, over 50% of this service's uh, pods are scheduled on just two instance types, increasing our uh, potential impact of a loss of one or both of those instance types due to a spot outage or something similar. Um, this is without using uh, spread constraints. Um, we'd really like to make use of them to obviously limit behavior like this going forward. Uh, vertical pod autoscaling. So memory-based vertical autoscaling isn't suitable for every language. Um, I'm being a bit facetious here in that JVM languages can now uh, be tuned through uh, JVM parameters, etc., to give Kubernetes a far better view into what the actual memory usage of a pod is. Um, however, it takes a lot of expertise. So it's not it's not simple. Um, I, I would suggest it's probably not uh, worth heading down that rabbit hole unless you really know what you're doing in terms of like tuning JVM heat parameters, etc. Um, but it can be done. Most of the time I would suggest it's probably not worth doing though. Um, you can also try combining horizontal and vertical pod auto scaling on the same metrics. Say, so if you tried say horizontal, uh, horizontal and vertical pod auto scaling on memory on the same workload, uh, this will generally lead to unintended behavior. The two will end up fighting with each other, and generally one or both will end up not understand, understanding what has gone on 
due to resources changing underneath it. Um, so generally, you can you can combine horizontal and vertical pod auto scaling on different metrics, but don't don't try doing both of them on the same metric at the same time. Um, and finally, ensure resource policies are set. Um, so this is this is taking up the same role as the resource quotas we're taking with the cluster auto scale uh, with the horizontal pod auto scaling. Sorry. Um, so this is preventing runaway scaling by saying this is the maximum size I am ever want a certain uh, container within this target to scale to. So you can uh, tell, make sure that the vertical pod auto scaling never gets into a situation where it's runaway scaling up. Um, a given container or a given pod to the point where it's you're getting ever bigger nodes and costing yourself money again. Uh, so cluster auto, finally cluster auto scaling. Um, so the the number one tip I would have is uh, to prioritize node startup time. So this um, not only has the benefit of your uh, cluster scaling up faster, pods being able to be scheduled from unschedulable faster, and um, it also allows you to tune a number of parameters from their def uh, defaults on the cluster auto scaler, so that you're more tolerant to the cluster auto scaler realizing that um, nodes have developed a fault, whether that's due to kubelet dying or um, a hardware failure or something similar. Uh, also beware that occasionally the simulation uh, that Joseph mentioned inside the cluster autoscaler, so when it goes, if I bring up a new node of this node group, what will it look like? What will its resources be? Um, occasionally that doesn't always match reality. Uh, you can occasionally see uh, instances in the cloud where, for instance, the memory varies slightly from node to node and potentially the cluster autoscaler will think that it can schedule a new pod on a new node in a given node group, but that doesn't actually match when the new node is brought up. Um, and finally, ens always ensure the system and Kubelet have enough resources on the nodes. So you can set up um, how much resources are reserved for the Kubelet and the system to make sure that they are operating. However, if, for instance, you're bringing up really big nodes um, and you're scheduling a load of pods on them that are trying to do a load of CPU work at startup time, you could, if you've not set these high enough, you can end up either starving the system or the Kubelet, uh, result in effectively uh, killing off the Kubelet because of resource starvation, at which point all the pods that have just been scheduled and done CPU work on that node become unready, uh, get potentially are killed, try to be scheduled onto new pod, uh, new nodes, end up uh, in a cycle of doom and giving you a very bad afternoon as slowly you've killed more and more of the cluster but due to resource starvation. That was pretty much it in terms of uh, sort of best practice tips. Um, we've got a couple of links um, to previous SIG autoscaling talks. So the, KubeCon EU earlier in the year. There's some good stuff there on um, uh, custom metrics and other bits. Um, and we've got a couple of links as well to um, some nice blog posts about best practices for auto scaling. Thank you very much. And any questions? Hello. Uh, Joseph Burnett here. I'm here for some live Q and A, and we've gotten quite a few good questions already in the chat. And I tried to answer as many as we could. Me and Guy have both been going through there and answering questions, um, but I'll take a few now. Um, let's see here. Um, I think this one's answered. Sorry, just give me a moment. So there was a question here. Um, we would like to scale based on custom metrics. Um, uh, our team needs to be able to scale based on the Kafka leg, as mentioned several times. Right now, you have to over we have to over provision our Kafka.
resource metrics. Um, and so you need to install an adapter in your cluster, um, which will be able to fetch those metrics. Um, in, for example, in GKE, you can install a stack driver adapter. And so, or so wherever the, that Kafka lag is, you can install an adapter to get to it and set it up as an external metric. You can target an average value and just say, for whatever the lag is, we would like, you know, this many pods for this period of this number of undelivered messages, or, you know, take a look at those uh, auto, uh, external uh, metric uh, docs, um, and that should be something that can help. It's definitely impossible to do. And if you have questions about it, stop by the um, Slack channel, auto scaling Slack channel on the Kubernetes um, workspace. Um, Okay, let me go on to another question here. Hopefully that answered that. Um, so uh, Carl asked a question. If a target raw value is set, the raw metric values are used directly. The controller then takes the mean of utilization of the raw value. Could you please elaborate? So it sounds like um, Carl's talking about external metrics. And um, maybe I'll take a moment to clarify something that um, I think is kind of confusing about the API. Um, when you specify a target uh, for external metrics, you can say value or average value. And these two behave uh, differently. When you say, I would like to target this value for this external metric, the HPA, by default every 15 seconds. We'll take a look at where the metric is now and where you want to be. And it will it, it will scale out or scale in to try to achieve that. Um, and it will keep doing that. So if the metric doesn't change, it'll keep scaling up, 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 or down, 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 whichever way you need to go in a feedback loop. However, if you set average value, not value, but average value, then instead it actually reconciles directly to the metric without regard to how many pods there are currently. So if, for example, you say I would like an average value of five pods, there are five undelivered messages per pod, so you're targeting an average value of five on an undelivered uh, message queue, then you won't get more pods if the value doesn't change. You'll just keep reconciling to the same number. Um, so I hope that answers that question. It's a little bit subtle, but um, uh, it could be clarified by like maybe um, looking at the examples. Uh, um, so if you're reconciling to undelivered messages, average value is the one that you want. Okay. Um, Guy, were there any that you wanted to pick out and answer? Um, I was just having a quick look. Um, I think there was there was one uh, about uh, whether there were recommendations about adding cluster auto scaler annotations to pods. Um, the way um, I've achieved this in the past is giving the um, the pods in the deployment themselves um, the uh, a service account and allowing that service account to um, add and remove annotations to those those pods. So effectively, they're only allowed to modify themselves. Um, and that way they can uh, implement that. Um, but I think that's pretty much us out of time for uh, answering questions on the call. Um, however, we're going to continue trying to answer any questions people may have had or we haven't managed to get to on um, Slack channel um, to dash kubecon dash maintainer. So um, if you've got any questions that we didn't answer, feel free to post them over there and we will try and get to them. Thank you very much.